great. So um, that's kind of a little bit a taster for the opportunities. There's plenty more. So what I want to uh, do next is just run through um, uh, uh, 10 areas, basically, where we think we need to make some significant changes if we are to um, uh, take these kind of green economic opportunities. Um, but firstly, um, what we're talking about is um, we're talking about whether we can have 10,000 uh, new green jobs. Now, obviously, in terms of trying to estimate uh, rather 100,000 new green jobs, <laughs> in terms of trying to estimate job numbers, um, some of the package we're about to release involves direct government investment, and it's pretty easy to estimate the numbers around direct government investment. Um, but the bulk of the package is about private sector growth and private sector jobs, um, because that's where the bulk of the jobs need to come from. And uh, estimating the number of jobs uh, from the private sector is an inexact science. We know there's tremendous opportunity. Um, but so that we're using 100,000 green jobs as a kind of overriding figure, but it could be significantly larger than that, and in the long run it has to be. The background to all of this is the global picture. Um, so the United Nations has been pushing very hard on this, that not only do we need to make this transition, but there are lots of jobs to be gained in the process of making this transition. Um, there are endless books. There's like a forest of books now that have come out about the, the clean technology sector and taking advantage of the new green economy. I mean, there's heaps and heaps more than this. Um, some of them from surprising sources, like Thomas Friedman, who uh, tends to be a very conservative economist in many respects. Um, he's talking very, pushing very strongly about taking advantage of the new green economy and getting into it. In New Zealand, uh, we've had the Pure Advantage Group has been promoting these issues. Um, which is a group of leading New Zealand business people. Uh, it includes people like Rob Fife from Air New Zealand and Rob Morrison's brother Lloyd from Infratil and numerous others um, engaged in that process, Philip Mills, um, who are all pushing to say New Zealand needs to make the most of these opportunities. <coughs> and of course the government's own, the government has set up its own green advisory group. Um, now, you know, we would argue that the ambition of the government's green advisory group isn't good, and I saw um, Jan Ryder put a statement out today um, about the, the limits that were put on the terms of reference of that group. Um, but at least uh, it's starting, the government itself is um, being pushed slowly or <laughs> ever so slowly in this direction to engage with this space. <coughs> so the, the ten areas I want to go through, the first is about direct government investment. What we know is that this is the, if you like, the very fast way to produce change, um, and it's necessary. So the United Nations say, look, markets are essential to it, but so is direct government investment. Um, and so the, the first part of it, I just want to talk about four areas. There's more detail in the book that we've handed out. Um, but the first is about extending the, um, the home insulation scheme. Uh, we've done 100,000 households. We've got the budget for another 100,000. We're saying extend it to a further 200,000 households. Um, this has very significant paybacks in terms of the investment. It's a great scheme. Um, it's something we're very proud of, and we think it can be taken further. It has real jobs advantages as well. The second part of it is about um, filling some of the gaps that are currently in the shortages around housing. Um, before the Christchurch rebuild gets absolutely underway, which will produce significant capacity constraints in the building sector, um, we think that we need to use the time between now and then to actually fill some of the gaps that there are currently in the state and um, other kinds of community sector housing. Um, so uh, an expanded build there. The third part of it is a series of investments to protect our natural environment. Um, this is, um, if you like, about brand protection, but it's not just about brand protection. Uh, I've talked a bit about the riparian fencing and planting projects, but there's a number of projects, including pest control, uh, that are really quite essential if we are to protect the long-term viability of the New Zealand economy. And the fourth part of the direct government investment is a, is a very small investment, but it's quite significant. It's about providing some certainty in the forestry sector. Um, so we've seen some increase in, in forestry plantings, but um, by providing some certainty around price um, in the forestry sector, and there's more detail in the booklet, um, we can stimulate a lot of jobs in the sector and also um, sequester a lot of carbon um, for a relatively small investment. It's just about providing some certainty around price. This is very important for New Zealand because, um, as I'm sure people realise, that in 2020 we're going to run into real um, problems in terms of our ghetto accounts um, as those forests start to be harvested. So the forestry we've planted will cover us through to 2012 in terms of sequestering emissions. Um, but once those forests start to be harvested, we're going to have a big spike in greenhouse emissions coming out of New Zealand. So providing some certainty to the forestry sector now will help us get through that period in the early 2020s when those forests are the second area is around um, infrastructure, but particularly I want to talk about the, the energy companies. Um, <coughs> this is perhaps 
New Zealand's great um, opportunity globally is the expansion in renewable energy um, globally. I mean, there's all sorts of numbers thrown around. This is a, you know, this is currently a $400 billion a year industry. It could be an $800 billion a year industry by 2015. Um, this is a huge opportunity for us as a country um, because of the expertise we have in this area. Um, us and Iceland obviously lead the world in terms of renewable electricity generation. Obviously, it's not just about electricity. It's about um, other kinds of liquid fuels as well. Um, but we do have a specific advantage here. <coughs> uh, this is a... This is a picture of, a, of one of our, you know, where we have particular advantages, actually geothermal. Uh, this is a picture of a micro-geothermal plant. This is an American-built plant um, in Utah. Um, but um, these are the kinds of plants that we actually have um, great ability to produce in New Zealand. So the first thing is uh, we would argue that we need to keep the energy companies in, um, in state ownership um, so that we retain the ability to use them to lead this kind of economic transformation. But what we want to do with them is focus them on the export potential. Uh, so currently these energy companies, they, they, some of them are a bit focused on export, but we want to really make them look at the export potential around renewables so that we can get a piece of the global action in terms of renewable energy. Um, and we want them to partner with private sector entrepreneurs. So we're saying keep them in public ownership, but encourage them into partnership with the private sector. Um, so that way we keep the headquarters in New Zealand, we keep the R&D in New Zealand, but we get the benefits that come with partnering with the private sector. And we think that's quite an important part of it. Um, some of the energy companies have actually been doing this, um, but we would encourage them to do more of it. In terms of providing capital, uh, one of the government's arguments around privatisation of the energy companies is they needed access to capital. Actually, you don't have to privatise them to get access to capital. These companies can issue energy bonds, which would actually be very attractive to New Zealand investors um, who have been so burnt by the finance company disaster. I mean, it would be a chance for people to be part of the green economic and energy revolution. We're saying target 1% of the global market. Um, targeting 1% of the global market, uh, you know, this is something, you, if we were to get 1% of the global renewable energy market, we're talking 40,000 to 60,000 jobs in New Zealand. It is, it is such a large global market. If you think about dairy, um, we're 2% of global dairy production. We're about a third of the export market in dairy. Um, we can be ambitious about getting a chunk of the global renewable energy market. We're nicely positioned to do it. If you think about New Zealand's GDP, we're only 0.16 of global GDP, um, but we could easily be 1% of this global market. It is a tremendous opportunity for our country, but we need to orient ourselves to it and embrace it. <coughs> 